Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy Pepino and I'm a student at Georgia Tech. I will be presenting Keydrown, eliminating software-based keystroke timing side channel attacks, authored by Michael Schwartz and his colleagues at the Graz University of Technology in Austria and Clementin Maurice at the Université de Rennes in France. This paper was originally presented at the 2018 NDSS Symposium, which was held in San Diego, California. The table of contents for this presentation is as follows. We'll begin with a review of the relevant terminology, and then give a high-level overview of the paper's structure. We'll then describe what a keystroke timing attack looks like, and then discuss interrupt handling on Linux and ARM architectures. We'll explore the existing countermeasures that the authors identify, and then jump into the details of Keydrown, including an overview of its function, the design and architecture, the performance against attacks, runtime impact on the system, and self-identified limitations and future work. We'll then conclude by reiterating the ideas presented in the lecture. In order to understand some of the concepts discussed in this presentation, it's important to review some of the terminology and core concepts we will be discussing. A side channel attack can be any attack that uses information gained from the underlying computer system rather than relying on software bugs. Things like power consumption, sound output, or in our case, timing information can be exploited and used maliciously. A keystroke timing attack is an example of a side channel attack, and we'll be discussing that throughout this lecture. An interrupt is another important concept to understand. It's defined as any signal, either originating from hardware or software, which indicates to the CPU that an event must be handled. An interrupt can be received from the internal system or from I.O. devices like mice and keyboards. The outline of this presentation will aim to present concepts in the same order as written in the paper. The authors begin by describing the dangers and effectiveness associated with keystroke timing attacks and show how such attacks can expose sensitive user information. Following up to this, they explain why the current existing countermeasures in this space are not sufficient. And finally, they propose their solution in the form of Keydrown, which is available as an x86 Debian package. They support their implementation with solid results that show that any attacker advantage is nullified by their program. So, to begin, let's ask why keystroke timing attacks are so effective. Firstly, keystroke timing attacks are hard to mitigate because an attacker only needs to probe a single spot in the keystroke path in order to track activity. On top of this, an attacker will have multiple opportunities to record a timing event, since a user might type in their password several times in one session. Although these traces might have variations in timing, it allows the attacker to collect a higher number of samples and observe a victim's typing behavior, allowing the attacker to perform a more sophisticated attack. Furthermore, a keystroke event is processed at several layers of the software stack, opening many side channels and vulnerabilities which could be exploited maliciously. We'll see later in this presentation that the existing countermeasures do not protect the entire stack, which opens up possibilities for attacks. Next, we aim to describe a keystroke timing attack at a high level. Keystroke timing monitoring only provides the attacker the timestamps of when a key was pressed and when that key was released. Timing attacks diverge from the traditional key logger in that they do not tell you which key was pressed. Keystroke information is stored natively in Linux operating systems in the proc stat and proc interrupts files. Proc interrupts shows exactly the number of interrupts received in a session, broken up by APIX, or Advanced Programming Interrupt Controllers. We'll jump into those more later. The attacker attempts to recover what was typed by the user by analyzing these timing measurements. Primarily, they look at a timing between keystrokes rather than the duration of the keystroke itself in order to infer information. To give a basic example, let's consider the difference between typing TO compared to typing TA. The inter-keystroke interval values might differ when typing two letters with the same hand or typing two letters with different hands. Although the disparity between these might only be a few milliseconds, 
It's enough to grant the attacker some type of insight into the sequence of letters that you are typing. To build on top of this, attacks might train probabilistic classifiers such as Markov models or neural networks in order to reduce the password guessing complexity even further. Taken from the Red Hat online documentation, we can see here an example of a typical PROC interrupts file. The first column shows the number of IRQs, or interrupt requests. The second column reports the type of interrupt, and the third column reports the name of the device located at that IRQ. Multi-core processors will report these counts for each CPU, seen in the second example file. It's clear that an attacker that is monitoring this file can record timestamps of when these values increment in order to deduce timing information and harvest that data for analysis. The authors make a distinction between trained and untrained sequences since keystroke timing attacks aim to exploit the time between two key clicks in order to infer information. A trained sequence is a string that is entered repeatedly such as a password or an email address. An untrained sequence is any string that is entered for the first time or very sparingly. Trained sequences will have shorter inter-keystroke interval values. Muscle memory kicks in due to the fact that the typist potentially types in this string multiple times each day. Interestingly, only touch typists are vulnerable to keystroke timing attacks, since those who hunt and peck for keys will have large interval values compared to the data that an attacker would normally see. In order to understand how systems can be vulnerable to keystroke timing attacks, it's important to have a strong conceptual understanding of interrupt handling. Interrupt handling is highly dependent on the underlying computer architecture, which means that the workflow above might differ in single core and multi-core processors. The figure above shows how interrupts are handled on Linux x86 systems. So starting at 1, interrupt generating hardware, such as keyboards or trackpads, are connected to an I.O. pin. The I.O. APIC, again that's Advanced Programmable Interrupt Controller, uses a redirection table to redirect the interrupt vector to the destination local APIC, or LAPIC, on the CPU. Each core has one LAPIC. The LAPIC receiving the interrupt vector fetches the corresponding entry from the interrupt descriptor table, or IDT. The IDT contains an offset to the interrupt service routine, ISR, for, any, for every interrupt vector. The CPU then saves the current CPU flags and jumps to the ISR, and the interrupt is handled. From this diagram, it's clear to see that keystrokes are handled at many layers, exposing many opportunities for a side channel attack. Here, we can see a high-level overview of interrupt handling on a dual-core ARM v7 CPU. It's largely similar to the one we saw on the previous slide, except that it contains an interrupt vector table, IVT, instead of the IDT seen in the x86 interrupt handling diagram. The IVT contains exactly one instruction to jump to a handler function, which then branches to the ISR. Additionally, interrupts are handled by a general interrupt controller as opposed to the IO APIC we saw on the previous slide. The authors allude to existing countermeasures in this space being insufficient, as they do not provide protection to the entire software stack. However, they didn't give any specific examples in their writing. Reading through some of the paper's references, one suggestion to protect against timing attacks was to restrict access to system interfaces such as procstat and proc interrupts, as these provide access to valuable interrupt statistics. Another suggestion was to randomize the keyboard layout so that even if an attacker deduced which key was being pressed through timing analysis, the value of the key would not match up to their guess on a traditional keyboard. However, this would have a dramatic effect on usability. Prior to the description of their implementation, the authors proposed three requirements for an effective countermeasure to timing attacks. Firstly, 
The countermeasure must minimize side channel accuracy. The countermeasure must take advantage of the fact that keystrokes are, in general, non-repeatable events and require a high deal of precision and recall for an attack to succeed. Must use this to prevent the attacker from gaining any advantage from side channels. Secondly, the countermeasure must reduce any statistical characteristics in password input. If an attack requires more traces than can practically be obtained, it is less effective. Thirdly, the implementation of the countermeasure itself must not leak side channel information. So let's jump into a high level overview and description of Keydrown. Proposed as a defense mechanism against keystroke timing attacks, the software injects a large number of fake keystrokes into the kernel, making the keystroke interrupt density uniform over time. Unlike the existing countermeasures, Keydrown covers the entire software stack, from the interrupt source all the way to the user space buffer storing the keystroke. Keydrown was designed in a multi-layered manner with each layer building upon the layer beneath and adding additional protection. The first layer, labeled kernel, implements a protection mechanism against interrupt-based and timing-based attacks by artificially injecting interrupts. A real keyboard interrupt replaces a fake one within a multitude of other fake interrupts, making the keystroke interrupt density uniform over time. To state it in a different manner, if you were to plot all keystroke interrupts over time, there would be no deviation at the points in time where the real keystrokes occur. The second layer, labeled library, protects the library handling the user input by sending a random keystroke to a hidden window, which triggers screen redraw events. The third layer, labeled widget, protects the password entry field by accessing the underlying buffer whenever a real or fake keystroke is received. The combination of these three layers voids any advantage the attacker might have gained by accessing the side channel. Let's examine the performance of Keydrone against two typical timing attacks. The procfs based attacks are any attacks that target the proc stat or proc interrupt directories. The RDTSC based attacks are those that occur at the interrupt level. F-score is a metric which was used as the standard measure of accuracy, which is a geometric mean of precision and recall. An F-score of 1 describes a perfect side channel, while an F-score of 0 describes that a side channel provides no information at all. Without Keydrown, the PROCFS-based attack achieved a perfect F-score of 1, and the RDTSC-based attack achieved 0 0.94. After Keydrown was enabled, the precision was reduced to 0.08 for PROCFS and 0.07 for RDTSC, showing a huge drop in the information provided from the side channel. The visualization shows the two attacks, with the real keystrokes being plotted by green dots and the fake keystrokes being injected being plotted as red triangles. The dotted line shows where Keydrown was enabled. The authors use a tool called LMBench for a performance analysis of Unix-based systems, which is a benchmark suite intended to simulate a realistic workload on multi-core systems. The results showed a performance overhead of 6.9%, showing that injected interrupts only had a small impact on kernel performance, which would normally sit around about 2.5%. For mobile-based ARM architectures, such as the Android operating system, Keydrown was shown to reduce battery lifetime by 4.6% for the average user. Power consumption was shown to be elevated at times when the keyboard was shown on the screen. The authors have identified a number of limitations with Keydrown. Firstly, studies show that keystroke timing attacks can be performed by a malicious observer over the network by using the PROCnet system interface which contains important information about the kernel. Keydrown did not account for defending against this type of remote attack. Some software-based side channels are not affected by Keydrown, including those that use sensors, such as an accelerometer, to perform an exploit. For mobile devices, Keydrown is not able to protect swipe-based inputs since their interrupt rate is too high. 
If a password is entered into the device by swiping across a keyboard rather than via touch events, it becomes vulnerable. The authors acknowledge that their proof of concept is not optimized, and the fake keystroke injections might actually interfere with input in some modern computer games, especially those which require a high click or typing rate. We are able to recap the main ideas presented in this paper as follows. Keystrokes are processed on many layers of the software stack, which exposes multiple vulnerabilities to a possible side channel attack. The entire software stack is not adequately covered by existing defense mechanisms. So the authors presented Keydrown as a novel solution, which mitigates keystroke timing attacks by injecting a large number of fake keystrokes at the kernel level and propagates them through all layers of the software stack. Through an evaluation which used existing known timing attacks, the authors demonstrate that any advantage gained from the information obtained from a side channel is now nullified with Keydrown. Thank you for watching this presentation, and I welcome any comments or hope to answer any questions that you might have in the Piazza discussion thread.